Welcome to the Mio on MMA podcast, talking about UFC 308 from Abu Dhabi. And we had a heck of a card. Kind of. Uh, it's, a bit, it's, a, it's a bit of a stretch to say heck of a card, I guess. But it was a pretty good card with absolutely two heartbreaking slash incredible moments to cap off the night with uh, Kamza Chamayev and Ilya Taporia being the, you know, kind of a, a changing the guard, so to speak, because we had Robert Whitaker and Max Holloway lose. I guess it's not really a changing the guards for Taporia because he is already the champion. So, you know, it has to be said that that's, that's probably, probably already been a change that has occurred, but like kind of putting it in that perspective and getting the job done in a very impressive fashion. And of course, comes with Jemaya proving maybe not quite as much as he probably would have liked, but like proving to a certain degree that he is absolutely going to be a guy to be dealt with at 185, which I had questions coming into that. I still have questions and I wanted to give myself some time to think about that, but let's get into it. Ilya Taporia versus Max Holloway. I had Holloway winning the first round up until Taporia scored a slip knockdown, which I gave the round to Taporia. That being said, I didn't uh, on on a rewatch. Obviously, I didn't think it was a knockdown, so I would have I would have changed my score if that was an option. The second round I gave just very very slightly to Holloway. Basically, Holloway was doing the Matador thing, Taporia the bull, and having a lot of success. His range, his technical striking. We're giving Taporia problems, but the thing that was very key was that as the rounds went on, Taporia was getting stronger and stronger. As the fight was going on, Taporia was getting stronger and stronger. And it was obvious you could see what was going to happen. There was a power, an explosive, a physical advantage that Taporia had that Holloway could not honestly match in the pocket. So every time Taporia was able to find the range, it became a very violent pro Taporia fight. And eventually in the third round, he gets him in one of those situations I was talking about. Knocks him down. Flurries. That's it. Done. Bam. Boom. He has now beaten Alexander Volkanovsky and Max Holloway in back-to-back -back fights, which a lot of people are claiming is the best two-fight uh, run in the history of MMA. Maybe. I think that's... I, I, I think it's hard to say what that, what that would really be. But at the same time, yeah, it's definitely up there. It is on the short list if it is not, in fact, there. And for our next fight, I have Taporia versus Diego Lopez. You could do the Islam Makashev fight, but I do not like the idea of Makashev fighting yet another featherweight. You have this probably never going to happen again thing with Lopez where he's on a hot streak. And don't get me wrong, I'll be picking Taporia all day in the fight. I, 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 don't, even, I don't even honestly know what a Lopez win would, would look like. Because, well, he does have the height, the range that we have seen be a problem for Taporia against Jai Herbert, against Bryce Mitchell, against Yusuf Zalal, and again here against Max Holloway. He doesn't have the he doesn't have the range management or the discipline to to really weaponize it in the same way that those guys had success. So, like, I would be picking Taporia all the way. But again, I would like to see that Lopez, you know. Well, it's hot. Give him the title shot. Let him go in there and let's stay away from the champ champ stuff for a little bit longer. We can do there, obviously, and a Makashev versus Taporia fight in the long run is definitely on the table. But I think we stay away from that. Max, Max Holloway versus Dustin Poirier would be the fight that I would I would propose. And if both guys are down, obviously you make that happen. If not, they're guys who have kind of earned the right to do whatever it is that they want beyond like demanding a title shot. So like Holloway should probably go up to 155. You know, just, you know, it, it, it's easier on the body, not cutting that extra 10 pounds. And there's, I think, more fresh and interesting matchups up there. So that's what I would do. Robert Whitaker versus Kamta Chabayev. This was, I said it in the pick predictions, I picked Whitaker to win because I was like, you know what? I'm a little bit worried that the garbage compactor that is Chabayev will not function at 185 without the weight advantage, without the size advantage. He has 
cardio issues, he has health issues, and all of this. And there were there were just bad vibes coming out of off of him. But apparently those vibes didn't matter because he went out there and he just put it on Robert Whitaker and eventually got his back and broke his jaw with something. Whether it was the 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 face crank that like ended the fight. Or if it happened before that, I don't know. I I suspect it was beforehand, just based on Whitaker's reaction. But we do know that Chmaev does have a heck of a grip. So, you know, there is that. And the downside of this is that I don't think we necessarily learn more about Chmaev. Don't get me wrong. We, 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 we learned that he could beat Robert Whitaker. But what I mean by that is that the question with Chmaev is he's a phenomenal one-round fighter. What happens after that? Because every time he's gone deeper than one round, it's been this kind of very underwhelming performance. And you can see that with the Kamara Usman fight. You can even see that with the Gilbert Burns fight, which is a phenomenal fight. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's a great fight. But it is a fight where he fades down the stretch here. Actually, let's have a look at the numbers here from Gilbert Burns fight. So yeah, he goes from having uh, a minute 44 of top control in the first round, landing 39 strikes to 41 strikes in the second round, but getting outlanded by Burns, and then getting outlanded by Burns in the third round as well, and the the wrestling stops being uh, as effective, the entries start being stop being as crisp, and then of course the problem with the Usman fight was just the majority decision nature of it against a guy who's a welterweight, admittedly one of the greatest welterweights of all time, but a welterweight nonetheless, and he's fighting at 170. So I don't know. It's 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 one of those things where like I could totally see. Kamzat Chumayev just winning the belt in the first round, just like doing this over and over again. Because I mean, who, who beyond a shadow of a doubt could I see this not happening to? And the answer is nobody. But at the same time, I kind of wonder if you can get out of the first round, if you can get to the later stage of the fight, does he just kind of fall apart? So it's a bit of a weird one. But um, I do have him against DDP for a title, depending on legal resolutions, because the issue with the issue with Kamzat Chumayev, and this is, I don't think we have like an official word on this, but maybe, maybe Kareem Zidane or someone has, has done a, has done a good article with like a specifically stated like U.S. Um, Department of Labor slash immigration slash, you know, whatever, whatever that would happen, whatever would uh, cover this, that he is not allowed in the country. But there is a general thought that there are a, a the U.S. and other countries probably will not let Shemayev in. So that obviously complicates things because you have, you know, a title fight is going to be on a pay-per-view. And there are is only usually one pay-per-view in Saudi Arabia, in, in the Middle East. There's probably going to be a second one because you get Saudi Arabia and UAE now. So Abu Dhabi, you got, you got Fight Island, you got Saudi Arabia. But that does limit you in a way that like might be a bit of a problem. It's a similar issue that uh, Magomed Agalaya faces, although, to be clear, um, the UFC is way less interested in Magomed Agalaya. We're going to talk about him in a bit. But I would say probably a title shot because they're not really interested in Sean Strickland. And that's that's really the only other option out there. I mean, you do have the up-and-coming Kyle Bahio. You do have the up-and-coming Anthony Hernandez. But um, the Nasser Diemovov. But, like, I don't think any of those really have the same the same riz maybe Bahio maybe Bahio in the long run but uh, I don't think yet and for Whitaker I've got Joe Pfeiffer Magomed Ankalaev versus Alexander Rakic was a fine fight uh, I scored it 29-28 for Ankalaev I don't have much else to say I mean it was it was it was the fight I kind of expected but was hoping not to get I was I was hoping one of these guys would like you know put a stamp on the fight as opposed to giving us a tepid kickboxing match. And that did not happen. And Goliath didn't really wrestle at all. Uh, in fact, I, I I don't remember him even going for a takedown. He didn't get one. Uh, they credit him with being 0 for 0. So yeah, there you go. And 0 for 1 for Rackage. I guess the only interesting thing here was that Rackage's corner actively, I think, sabotaging their fighter by telling him that he was winning when I don't think he was. Like, um, I gave Rackage the first round. Don't get me wrong. And I, and I could totally see him being up two rounds to none. But you're in Abu Dhabi and you're fighting a Muslim fighter. You got to be really up in order to actually like guarantee anything. And like he definitely lost the third round. I thought the second round's a bit of a flip. And then like I just edged him the first round. But like the first round's also a flip. It It's um, 
it's bad cornering. It's bad advice. It's it's what I kind of expect from Rackage's corner. Honestly, they've they've never had good advice, which is a significant problem. And Goliath should get a title shot against Poetan. There you go. Rackage against Ryan Spawn. I couldn't think of anything to do with Ryan Spawn last time out, so uh, that does feel like uh, a correct one. Lerone Murphy versus Dane Ige. I picked uh, Lerone Murphy in this one, and um, the reasons I picked him to win were obviously there. The speedness, the quickness, the better athletic ability, the better physicality of the fighter, the largeness, the ability to engage at a range that Ige has never really been comfortable at. But at the same time, he also almost blew it on a couple occasions by agreeing to grapple with Dan Ige at some very inopportune times and also just not being ready for like some of the Ige specials like Ige's check hook. It's like, all right, you need to be ready for this. You need to be ready for the check hook. Boom. Why are you getting bonked by Dan Ige like repetitively every time you're in the pocket? Anyways, uh, Murphy gets the win. But uh, like I said, I probably... Probably a fight that honestly kind of like damages his um, damages his upside, to be honest. But he was able to do a lot of the things I expected him to do. And that's kind of really all there is to it. He got dropped in the first round. I gave EGA the first round. And then I gave Murphy the remainder. Uh, he called out Josh Emmett afterwards. And I, I guess that's as good a fight as any. And I've got EGA against Sadiq Yusef. Shara Megamadoff versus Armin Petrosian. With the double back fist knockout here for Shara with the one, two spinning back fist to get the job done against Petrosian. Petrosian, I thought, won the first round early on. The things I thought were there, like the, the crisper striking, the more technical aspects of his game were scaring the day. But it was like also very clear that like to a certain degree, like uh, Ilya Taporia, that Shara just had the explosiveness and the speed that is... Um, well, it's basically a cheat code, and it makes up for a lot of technical failings. Now, with Tapori, it's unfair because Tapori actually also prepares himself and is like a very cerebral fighter on top of that. Char is not really. I wouldn't say that he's stupid, but like definitely not on the same level. And that was the that was the issue is that there wasn't really any kind of safety that Petrosian could could find because obviously you cannot engage him like from a safe distance at range because Char has got the kicking game and like also taller, longer, etc. cetera. Uh, or I don't think he's taller. I think, I think Petrosian, yeah, Petrosian's taller, but Petrosian is one of those weird ones where he's like six foot three, but has a 71 inch reach. Whereas like Shara Bullet is six foot two with a 73 inch reach. So like, you know, uh, Shara was able to engage at the, at, at, any, at any range that would be like safe for Petro, that would be effective for Petrosian. So there was no safety there. And eventually, yeah, he just kind of got caught. Uh, does this change my opinion of Shara? A little bit, because I think I have more appreciation for his speed and his explosiveness and therefore his danger level that I didn't quite have before. But I don't think I gained any any additional appreciation from him as a um, as a technical marvel. Don't get me wrong. It's not that he's a terrible striker or anything. He's not. He's, he's quite quite good. It's just. Um, when you look at the. You look at the hype train, I think it doesn't really match up with the skills. And at some point, it's going to get highlighted in a way that's going to be bad for Char Bullet. I've got him against Michelle Pahea next, and I've got Petrosian against Zach Reese. Ebal Aslan destroyed Rafael uh, Sakara. I'll happily take the win. I picked the underdog here because he was the underdog, and that was it. Aslan and his fans were going nuts after this, though, talking about how, how much of a ceiling this guy has. And I just... I. I guess I believe it. Don't get me wrong. Like, he has all the physical abilities, but, like, I don't think he's actually all that, like, good. And he's 28 years old, and this is 205, so he's got time. He's got, like, I don't know, four four to six years to kind of still form himself. And maybe it'll happen, but, like, I, um, I don't really have a lot of faith that it will because of how, how high on his own supply that he is. Sakara's just not good. Like, just bad. <laughs> This is what it comes down to. I've got Marcin Prachnio for Aslan, and I've got Sakara versus a Dana White Contender Series uh, alum. We had an injury in the Rafael Dos Anjos versus Jeff Neal fight where RDA just kind of falls over and his leg was very clearly hurt. He was getting worked before then. Like, I'm not I'm not going to defend um, in any way, shape, or form. Like, what, what that was, it was like 18 to 4 in official in, uh, significant strikes, 21 to 4 in, in total strikes. 
Uh, it didn't look like RDA had like anything for Jeff Neal. I didn't expect him to. 170 is just an area where he's too small. And if he can't make 155, I, I think this is the end of the road. I'm not telling him to retire because that's that's between him. That's between him and his family and his coaches, basically. And I guess the UFC, if they want to keep booking him. But I am... Um, I am at the point where, like, I don't think I have any interest in seeing RDA fight. Now, to be clear, the fact that RDA made it to being 40 years old, well, me, with me still caring, is pretty impressive. Like, that's a long, effective career. That's a longer career than most get, but we are at that point. So, I don't really care who they match him up with next. I've got Jeff Neal against Gilbert Burns. Um, for Neal, I, I don't think that this really necessarily is... It doesn't really ne- raise his stock. But, like, he is a guy who has a win over Bilal Muhammad, who is the champion. And he is definitely kind of like a top 15, if not top 10 guy. So, that was there beforehand. It's still there now. And uh, a fight with Gilbert Burns could possibly actually be something that would raise his stock. So, that would be a good idea. Mickey Quebec Orobai versus uh, Matush Rambeski was a great fight. Uh, Rambeski lit him up at the start quite badly. Busted up. Orobai's eye. Orobai was trying to do the um the plum catch thing where like he would um he would kind of wade into the pocket and look to catch the head of Rebeski with a uh, a tie plum and then utilize that I assume to get into a takedown in a wrestling exchange and it was not working. It was just getting him lit up and his eye absolutely boned up. Uh between rounds the doctor comes in and has a look at it. Apparently, he could still see. We continued on. And Oral Bai did quite well in the second round to come back and actually, like, you know, make this into a bit of a wrestling matchup. He had, I think, both of his takedowns in this round. No, just one. He was one for four in takedowns. But, like, he was able to at least put the pressure on. Rembeski was also fading a little bit, as he is known to do, because he is bricked up as all heck. And it allowed Oral Bai to take the round. And apparently he got a split decision, which I I need to look up here. What would be the other? What would be the other round that got scored for him? Because in the in the third round he got he got murdered. He got beaten up and almost killed. And then he came back and ended up the round in a good place. It was the third round. Okay, well Mont- Jacob Montalvo gave the third round, which is wrong. <laughs> you could go. You could go 30-27 uh, Rembeski here, or you can go 29-28 Rembeski. I, 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 don't, I don't think that there's any oral buy card here. Uh, anyways, uh, basically both these guys were getting it for free. Oral buy with the, with the uppercut, and Rembeski with the, you know, basically just overhand to the eyeball. And he almost killed him. Like, he had him in the, he had him in the, he had him in a crucifix in the third round. He was dropping bombs. Oral buy somehow survived, got onto Rembeski's back. And, you know, like I said, had like 90 seconds of like fairly, um, fairly good control at the end of the round. But like he was, he was almost like killed before then. And I think you have to, you have to give that round to Rembeski. I'm, I'm wondering what the, what were the stats on that round? Rembeski apparently outlanded him 42-35. So yeah, he outlanded him with more, hurt him worse. And you got to give him that round. That's all there is to it. So Ben Cartlidge, Sal Diamato. You're both crappy judges, but you got it right this time. Jacob Montalvo, you did not. So there you go. We're gonna t- don't worry. We're gonna talk about some bad judging uh, judging later on. Uh, Rumbuski, I have against uh, Ferris Yam. Oral I have against Joe Selecki. That'd be a fun fight. Abus Mega Madoff versus Bruno Fajaya. Abus looked good. I guess that's all I can really say. I gave him the first round. I gave Fajaya the second round, and then he finished him in the third round. So like a. Uh, uh, a later round finish for a boost mega made off is pretty good. Uh, granted, uh, against Bruno Fajaya, who's not very good. I want to be clear on that. But at the same time, he was able to work his range for a large part. He was able to get some takedowns and get some top control as well. There were some blitzes. It was, it was controlled. And I still do think that if somebody could put a pace on him, they could probably tire him out. They could probably get him to fall apart, kind of like he used to. But we're at the point where, like, it appears that at least a boost Maga Madoff will not destroy himself. You have to actually make him fight at that pace. You have to actually bring something to him to make that a thing. And it didn't used to be the case. So very good work there. Uh, he got a he got a tap out with an arm triangle. Pardon me. I I I, I think I said TKO. 
But no, is an arm triangle t- uh, tap out here for a boost Mega Madoff. So get in top position, getting getting the job done here. Uh, as for what's next, a boost versus Jung Young Park, the Iron Turtle. And for Fahey, I have Andre Petroski because I am really tired of Andre Petroski having like any hype. So like if he was to go in there and face off with Bruno Fahey, the guy who just got arm triangle by a boost Mega Madoff, which is Petroski's move. And Petrovsky does not get that submission. That's going to be embarrassing. Kenny and Jekutu beat Chris Barnett. Barnett hurt his leg. I'm pretty sure in the intro here, he says he didn't, but I, I, I am. Um, I don't believe him. I don't believe him. And then he hurt himself worse on a spinning, uh, a spinning kick, and just got worked down and broken down. Uh, I don't really have much else to say about that. Kenny and Jekutu versus Duntel Mays. Barnett versus. Recovery and uh, when he comes back, give him some kind of mean fight. Obviously, that's all that there is for him. He's a five foot nine heavyweight, and that means that he he really does exist kind of in his own little world with other like kind of really just weird fighters. Uh, Farad Basharat just basically outworked Victor Hugo. I don't I don't have much else to say. Hugo was looking for like takedowns and stuff. It's never a good idea when the guy whose nickname is the Striker. And rightfully so, is looking for takedowns. That's kind of bad. And realistically, like, I, I I gave Hugo the first round, but I saw the signs that this was going to go Basharat's way, and uh, it slowly did. Obviously, the big thing here was that Basharat, uh, and Basharat almost made weight for a band of weight, but this ended up being catch weight because Victor Hugo, uh, or a featherweight bat, actually, I think, uh, entirely, uh, Victor Hugo could not make weight. <laughs> um... And I'm looking at the first round and I'm kind of wondering if I need to rewatch this round because apparently it was 27 to 11 in significant strikes or 20, 22 to 10 for in significant strikes, 27 to 11 overall for Basharat. So I don't know. Maybe maybe I need to rewatch that one and probably uh, update this to a 3027. Only one judge gave him a 3027. That was Mike Bell. Uh, David Letheby. Well, okay. Uh, the the round that, that, uh, that Hugo got on uh, Hadi Muhammad Ali, we're going to talk about you in a bit, uh, was a 10-9 second round. And Hugo got the third round on David Letheby's card. So I, I, it looks like I did have a wrong card here, uh, at least based on the consensus. So there is that. Hugo has to go up to 145, I think, at this point. He's had issues with the weight before. And um, he's pretty goddamn big. Like, you watch him in this fight, he doesn't look he doesn't look like a bantam weight. Uh, in there with another man of weight. So uh, move up to 145, fight someone off Contender Series. That's what I would do with him. Basharata have against Daniel Santos uh, to give him a solid for this one. Ishmael Nardia or Nardiev defeated Bruno Silva. Bruno Silva looks done. That's just all there is to this fight. He looked incredibly flat, didn't look like he wanted to be there, and he got he he just got wrecked. He got destroyed. Uh, not, not, not in like an entertaining way, just like in a way that like nothing was working. I, I, I wonder, uh, what were the stats just out of morbid curiosity? He apparently landed 36 strikes, significant strikes, 12, 14 and 10. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, now have got some takedowns as well. Three for 10 wasn't great, but like he did turn three takedowns into five minutes, almost six minutes of top control. So that's good. And like I said, he just outworked him and outstruck him in all three rounds by like significant margins outside of the first round. So Silva looked really, really bad. He needs to retire again. I'm not I'm not going to force him. It's between his family. It's between the coaches, between the UFC, whether he uh, he gets booked again. But uh, I am not. I, I, I wasn't very interested to begin with, and I am definitely not interested now. There you go. Uh, I'm not super interested in Nauer Diev anyways, though, because again, this fight was more about Silva just looking bad. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe my mind will be changed. Maybe Nauer Diev has really become better, but his his run coming into this fight was not amazing. And then the robbery of this of this card was Renat Fakradinov versus Carlos Leal. I bet on Fakradinov at um, minus 215 odds. And uh, I I felt so bad about getting the money for this fight that I actually uh, I actually donated to charity at the grocery store. <laughs> I was just like I, they're doing like a Salvation Army at the grocery store. I'm just like, yeah, no, you can you can have this because I I I, I should not have it. I should not. 
Carlos Leal, I thought, won all three rounds of this fight. Now, the first round I could see going to Renat Fakhradinov. He had some success. He had some takedowns. We know the UFC judges love. They do love that. They do love the takedowns. They do love the control. But that was kind of it. Like, otherwise, he he got badly outlanded in all three rounds. And like I said, the well, eh, apparently he outlanded him in the third round. I guess you could give him that. But there was a 30-27 here that gave the second round to Fakhradinov, a round in which he went one for four on takedowns, got outlanded and busted up. And like Leal was just way ahead of him on the feet, way ahead of him on the feet. And that was uh, that was the card put it turned in by uh, Hadi Muhammad Ali. Uh, again, not that it means anything, but I'm looking at MMADecisions.com. Every media score from Cage Side Press to MMA Fighting to Uncrowned to Sports Illustrated to MMA Junkie to Sure Dog to the score, to WrestlingObserver.com, to the MMA Vivis section, to the DDR reporter, I don't even know what that is, <laughs> to the Sporting News, had this for Leal, either 30-27 or 29-28, and um, it was just ridiculous. Also, side note here, David Lethaby's card's also garbage because he gave the second round to Fakhradina. He gave round one to Leal. The only defendable card is Michael Bell's because he gave the first and the third to Fakhradi. Now he gave the second to Leal, uh, which I, I still would not argue. I, I would still, I would still argue against that, but it is the only defendable card that was turned in for this bout to open up. And, and some people are like, well, maybe it was the, uh, maybe it was a really pro Renat crowd. This was early in the day. This was early in the card. This was the opener. There weren't enough people there <laughs> to, to, to actually to actually make that happen. So, yeah. Oh, um, on the prior one, now already have I have against Jacob Malkoon and Silva, like I said, retirement uh, for Renat Fakhradinov. He won. I'm matching him like he's a winner and hoping that he loses to Michael Morales. And for Leal, I have him against the winner of Matthew Semmelsberger. Versus Charles Radke. And again, this was this was a legendary robbery that we'll probably forget because I don't think Renat Fakhradinov or Carlos Leal are really going to like do a lot. I, I, I don't think that that's really on the table, uh, particularly with Leal. So I think we'll forget about it. But like this was this was some all time bad scoring and the fight was otherwise pretty good. I enjoyed it. Leal put on a really good technical striking clinic. If you have not seen this fight, go watch it. And then don't listen to the judge's decision at all. Because <laughs> it's wrong. Because it's terrible. All right, that's UFC 308 in the books. I will see you for the next fight card, which is going to be... Who... What we got next? We got... um. All oh, right, we're going to Edmonton, Alberta for the uh, Moreno versus Albazi card. Brandon Moreno versus Amir Albazi, Rose Namunas versus Aaron Blanchfield. Looking forward to that fight. Looking forward to both those fights, actually. But then Derek Lewis versus Junta, uh, Junta Diniz. Kyle Machado versus Brinson Hibero. Why is Hibero back? That's my honest to God question. I don't know why he's even here. Did he not? Did he not get cut? Oh, I guess he never got cut. Uh, he's the guy who's lost to Ming Yang Zong and uh, Magomed G uh, Gadzi Yashilov, who are not very good, to be clear. Uh, and he lost to both of them. So, like, I don't, that's a main card fight. That's weird. Mark Andre Barrio versus Dustin Stolfus. Eh. Mike Malott versus Trevin Giles. Eh. Uh, Ivan Zahabi versus Pedro Munoz. Eh, better. Arian Lipsky versus Jasmine Jusudovicius makes a lot of sense. Charles Jordan versus Victor Henry. Looking forward to that. Jordan is going down to 135. I don't really think that's going to fix any of his problems, but hey, it's still there. Alexander Romanov versus Rodrigo Nascimento. Please, God, that's a terrible fight. Siri City versus Garrett Armfield. That's good. I enjoy that one. Chad Ann Hilliger versus Cody Gibson. I don't think that's going to be very competitive, but, you know, it'll be fun. Uh, Jamie Lynn Horf versus Ivana Petrovich. Eh. And uh, Jack Shore versus Yusuf Zalal. Why is that the opener? That's a good fight. That's a dope fight. I'm looking forward to that. That's that's like that is that is that is my like third favorite fight on the card. 
<laughs> Why is that so low? Uh, anyways, check the uh, description for social medias to my Discord server with the MMA with the MMA uh, fight uh, simulator, as well as my social medias and other nerd stuff with video gaming. If that happens to be your persuasion, I will see you next time.